Hello? Alright, today we are going to be talking about the other, quote-unquote, other antimicrobial drugs. So, um, again, depending on what textbook you use, uh, what your sources you're looking at, it can be classified in some different ways, but for my testing purposes, please stick to these categories. So, overview, we're going to talk about the antimicrobacterials, oops, antivirals, antiparasitics, and antifungals. Um, just off the bat, I'd like to, to kind of warn you guys, with the antivirals, there's going to be some that I want you to focus on more than others, and I'll, I'll touch upon those later. But basically, the HIV, AIDS uh, medications, um, I don't want you to spend as much time with for this module. Um, it will be something you'll probably be seeing later on in ICM. But um, for testing purposes for me, there's, it's not going to be heavy on that. So, um, so don't let that overwhelm me if, you're, if you've already kind of looked ahead. So first off, we have the antimicrobacterial. -myc Just notice here that the dapsone is in this category because it is antimicrobacterial, but it's only used for leprosy. Um, so you can kind of set that aside. It's a little bit different. We'll, we'll have a slide on that. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, then you have up here your tuberculosis medications, and then you have alternative drugs. And we'll go through those right now. Management of tuberculosis. So don't stress about this slide. Um, part of the reason is because it is out of date. So with tuberculosis, I would highly encourage you all to go to the CDC's website when you're out on practice and or when you're um, on rotations just to get the most up-to-date current information. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Little editing magic there. Okay, ta-da. So CDC, Centers for Disease and Control, Disease Control and Prevention. Um, I don't know if you guys have been on this website yet uh, with other courses or whatever. I'm not sure. Um, so just fast forward through this if this is review for you guys. You don't need any of this. But um, CD4 24-7, saving lives, protecting people. I like I like their uh, their slogan. But um, but anyways, that's not on the tester. That's not important. I just I always get a kick out of their slogan. So um, CDC is great for all things related to disease control and prevention. Um, it's in the title. But um, great, great resources for students while you're on rotations and then for practitioners. So this isn't something this is something that this is a website and a source that the most veteran infectious disease doctors are using. The most veteran internal medicine doctors are used, specialists, etc. So this is a, a great um, source. Can't stress that enough. So don't ever feel bad about coming to this source and using it. Um, another quick plug too for CDC. Uh, my wife and I, we both have the app. There's some apps that CDC has on their for your on your phone or iPad or whatever. Um, check those out. So she was on pediatrics last month. There's a CDC app for the immunization schedule, for example. So um, maybe worth some time, kind of getting that, looking for that. Um, and it was it's a nice little app or whatever. Anyway, so tuberculosis is what we're talking about today. Don't want to get too dis distracted, but um, you notice here it has a whole bunch of different things you can cl click on here. Um, so it just kind of depends on, on what you're looking for at that time. Um, but for pharmacology, uh, we're interested mainly in treatment. So we have the treatment and guidelines here. So click on that, which I already did. Let's see, pull it'll pull this up, treatment for TB disease. Um, and so you'll notice there's currently 10 drugs that are approved, but of those right now, there's just the four that are considered first line therapy for, um, and again, this is your average TB patient um, in infectious disease. Your pathophysiology you may have heard about, you know, if a, pre a pregnant woman gets TB, if someone has HIV gets TB. Um, so those will be your, um, your special populations, quote unquote, special populations. And those are over here, specific populations. So if you click on that, let's see if this works. Live demonstration. <laughs> Um, specific populations. So, and he goes through different things, children, curricular officials, um, homelessness, um, African-American community, international travelers, etc. cetera. Um, so for my testing purposes, this is not something you need to stress about. And this is something I feel like you'll get more on rotations, etc. later on. Um, also too, so if you also click on this guidelines link here, it pulls up this window and then it also shows you TB and HIV, for example, or TB in specific populations, and it'll give you the guidelines there. Um, but again, for my testing purposes, for my course, I, I just want you guys to have a good foundation in pharmacology um, and not stress too much about getting into the weeds, so to speak. So I definitely want you guys to know the top four first line drugs. So that is isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, and py pyrazinamide. The fourth one. So those are going to be your four. Um, again, the, so for my for testing purposes, etc., these are the ones you need to be concerned with. Um, and 
this is something that again you'll need to keep up to date with when you're out in practice um, and then so if you you go look look here well, and we're going to go through these on my slides and I'll I'll um, just tell you what you need to know about these but anyways um, click here on this website TB regimens for drug susceptible TB I like this table and again if you're initiating or if you're seeing someone that was on who has been initiated on it um, notice that this is the regimen effectiveness is greater at the top and it goes down so um, this is going to be your first line treatment here and you'll notice those four drugs are just mentioned and a lot of times in TB by the way they do abbreviate them so um, for testing purposes I will spell out the names but know the INH, RIF, EMB, PZA it's not I always want to say pizza but it's not pizza um, it's or like PIZA, like, I don't know, Wu-Tang fans out there, like the RZA, the JZA, the PIZA, no, um, long lost Wu-Tang member, no, but um, it's good to know those abbreviations because you will see those on patients' charts, um, and as far as, sometimes people refer to them as INH, for example, you know, they'll refer to them by their a letter abbreviation, uh, but you'll notice there's an intensive phase here, um, and this will probably be, you'll be getting more in detail in ICM, um, but I just want to show you what good sources, and then you have your continuation phase, and then it has a comments here. So it look, notice here, this is the preferred regimen for patients with newly diagnosed pulmonary TB. Um, so you can go and look through that. They also have some other resources here. So for healthcare providers, treatment fact sheets, um, which let's check that out. That might be good. And some of these other things, fact sheets, fact sheets. Yeah, so these are ones you can print out, uh, maybe have with you if you like something to hold on to or something you can refer to. Um, all right, you'll notice some of these two, depending on what clinic you're at, they'll have these posted in the clinic. So they'll print off the most current one. And some of the pharmacies I've worked at too, they'll, will have things from the CDC, uh, posted on the wall, just as a reminder. Um, drug resistance is another issue, unfortunately with TB and we'll, well, the only reason I'm mentioning this is just, I mean, it's part of the theme of antimicrobials. You guys have, it's, you probably are all rolling your eyes right now. I can, I can hear the eyes rolling. No, but so drug resistance, unfortunately is something we still need to consider and it, CDC has a great website on that. And so that's why you'll notice that there are some different drugs listed for drug resistance. And so you can go to the treatment of drug resistant TB. Um, but for testing purposes for me, again, focus on those main four um, and we'll go through those in the slides. So just to, just to make sure we're all clear, don't worry about this slide as far as um, memorizing it and looking at it. Um, just a big reason is because this, this is out of date since the book has been published. Things have changed with the management of tuberculosis. All right, these I definitely want you to look at and pay attention to are the specific drugs. Um, you'll notice, you'll remember from the CDC website, this is one of the four that I want you guys to look at. Um, this isn't this slide specifically isn't that big of a deal, don't worry. Just know that depending on the individual, there are some genetic variants between people and it basically either fast or slow uh, metabolizers or acetylators. Um, and so um, that can affect the dosing a, a little bit, just depends, but that's more of an FYI slide for, for my testing purposes. Mechanism of action, take home point, inhibits the synthesis of mycolic acids. So basically does not allow the cell wall to develop properly and therefore kills the bacteria. Um, resistance is a problem, um, like I mentioned, and you can just read through that as far as modes of resistance. Use, so why we're talking about it here is because it helps. And again, with the CDC, it's one of the four that's recommended to be used for tuberculosis. Um, and you'll notice too, it's, you, it's in combination, which that slide, I think, I'm sorry, which the website, I think illustrates that point um, that, you know, I showed those treatment guidelines, please refer back to those, but um, shows you that, you know, you have the four. You notice streptomycin's on here. Um, so as of when this book was published and depending on what res sources you look at, streptomycin was considered first line, um, but I have a slide on it later on, but it's not anymore. So it's just those four now, it's the, um, the four that were listed on the CDC website. Adverse effects. So with the four medications, definitely put a star by the adverse effects. I definitely want you guys to memorize adverse effects with these medications. Um, part of it is because this is what you'll see on your boards. <laughs> and the other part too is that it's important when these pe people are on these antimicro um, antimicrobials um, that you are mindful and aware of the adverse effects. Why? Because you'll notice here that it is, they are going to be on these medications for a long time. So eight weeks, 18 weeks, 18. So range of total doses are going to be exposed to a lot of doses and they're going to be on these 
um, for a long time. So it looks up here, it says regimens for treating TBCs have an intensive phase of two months, followed by a continuation phase of either four to, or seven months. So for a total of up to nine months of treatment and sometimes longer, but again, this is just kind of your average. So because of uh, uh, most, time, most of the times and most of these antibiotics we've been talking about, I haven't stressed too much on the adverse effects and drug interactions, et cetera, because the, for the most part, um, you know, a person doesn't need to be on an antimicrobial for nine months. Um, the most part, you know, you're on an antibiotic for seven days, let's say, maybe 14, um, you know, maybe three days. It's not something, where, but with these TB drugs, so adverse effects, you definitely have to be concerned about, and it sometimes can affect which ones you pick or if you, you know, modify it or if you give them other medications or you know etc so um so that's this is a big difference here and, and part of the reason it's important um and then like i said too it's on the <laughs> on your boards too um so i want you guys to do well on your boards right um so hepatic dam damage definitely put a star by that it is a box warning so this is something that um and it's a big box warning too in the sense that there's a there's a, it's a really long box warning. Some box warnings are short and sweet, so to speak, and some are, um, but it can be a fatal hepatitis that can happen. Um, and it can happen, um, it can happen, you know, early on, or it can be up to three months later. So you notice here, it says up to three months of treatment, but then many months after treatment. So it is something that, um, you definitely have to be worried about with this medication and something to be thinking about. Um, part of the hepatitis is it is age related. So um, the older the person, the higher the risk of this box warning, but still it's for all people that are prescribed this. So um, that is something that um, to, to think about too, that there is an age component. There's another, there's also a component or a risk associated with alcohol consumption. So the hepatic damage or the hepatitis then uh, is increased if a person has daily consumption of alcohol. So that's something else to think about. Um, or maybe encourage your patient, your patient to stop taking alcohol or stop drinking alcohol rather, um, while they're on this medication. Um, you know, just patient to patient kind of depends. So because of the severity of this um, box warning, it is recommended to monitor. So you um, specifically look at the AST and ALT, which are a couple of uh, measures that I believe you learn about in ICM, but those are um, measures of liver function. And so that'll give you a good idea if the liver is functioning properly. And if those are elevated too much, um, then it's a sign of uh, liver damage or that you may have some hepatitis or some hepatic imp impairment in hepatitis. Interesting enough, there is not um, no dosing adjustments provided um, from the manufacturer if a person has hepatic impairment. Um, however, there's definitely it's, it's cautioned and like I said there's a box warning and that it is contraindicated in patients with acute liver disease or if they've had previous isoniazid associated hepatic injury um, so anyways the other thing is too so when the person's on it if while measuring the ALT and AST if it becomes three times baseline as another recommendation to go ahead and discontinue or temporarily withhold the treatment um, so anyways Definitely want you guys to remember that. The other one too to note is the peripheral neuritis. Also, please note too that that is reversed by pyridoxine. And pyridoxine is also known as also known as B6 or vitamin B6. Uh, so you may hear it referred to as either of those. So just put a note there that's also B6. Um, and definitely again, something I've seen on board questions, but um, it's more prominent in solicylators, but just note in general for the, dr for the drug. Um, and then because of this B6, deficiency, um, you can have uh, anemia with this as well. So patients will complain about this, you know, I, I, again, I don't know if you've already been over this in ICM or in your other courses, but neuritis is basically, it's, it's nerve pain or inflammation in the nerve. And then, so you'll have this tingling, burning, sharp pain um, that they'll have like a pins and needles, quote unquote, um, description from patients, uh, maybe weakness, numbness, um, so anyways, uh, maybe slower reflexes, which you guys will be learning a lot more about those in, in some of your other courses. But um, so definitely the neuritis and then the hepatic damage. And then the antidote, so to speak, is B6 for the neuritis. So that helps. So definitely please note all of those. Rifampin. This one, um, just this is FYI. Um, don't worry too much about this. Um, just read through the pharmacokinetics. Won't be testing you on that. Um, mechanism of action. Um, Take-home point inhibits bacterial RNA synthesis. 
um, and then it therefore blocks RNA transcription and therefore, you know, kills the microorganism. Um, and then resistance is still an issue. Another thing to note about rifampin is that there is another generic or chemical name. It's rif rifampicin. So it's R-I-F-A-M-P-I-C-I-N. So for my testing purposes, you will just see the right rifampin. Um, but just know that that is out there and some in some other so sources. It's not a brand name. It has some other brand names like uh, rifidin and um yeah, some other, the, the Rifidin's the, the brand name of it, but um, so it, it's one of those that has two, so sometimes this happens where there'll be two generics or two chemical names, so Rifampin's the one that, um, for me, but if you see other textbooks refer to uh, Rifampicin is the same thing as Rifampin. So uses, um, we, I mean, this is why we're here now, uh, it's TB, definitely combination, we'll talk about, I mean, like I said, it's those that four drug combination the CDC recommends. Um, also, has, this is interesting because you'll see it for some other things. Read through these. So, for example, use with azithromycin for Legionnaire's disease, um, use with lepros leprosy in combination with some of the other things, um, and then maybe some prophylactic uses there, too. Adverse effects. So, again, put a star by this slide and for the reasons I mentioned. So, for all four of these drugs, definitely want you to pay attention to adverse effects. The one that kind of stands out in everyone's mind or is the one that I... I don't know, for whatever reason, sticks out of my mind. It says there'll be this red-orange discoloration of urine, tears, and saliva. It also freaks patients out. So it's definitely something to, to know and to warn patients about. Um, and it's why I think of this, uh, I don't know if you guys are too young or remember when Michael Jordan used to sweat Gatorade, but I always think of Michael Jordan sweating the Gatorade because of the orange um, orange discoloration of urine, tears, and saliva. I think maybe when I was in pharmacy school, these ads were out. I don't know. But so if that helps you, then it helps you. If not, don't worry about it. But rifampin um, is the one that has that. Hepatotoxicity is a concern. It's not as strong as the previous medication, as the isoniazid, um, but it's there. It's something you need to think about, but it, there's no box warning and there's no dosage adjustments. Um, uh, but, you know, it's going to be given in combination with another medication that's hepatotoxic. So, um, again, could be partly kind of related and something to be thinking about. Drug interactions, big one here, put a star by that. It's a potent inducer of the, of the P450 system. Um, so then it can reduce these the concentration of a lot of these different drugs. You'll notice here, so seizure medications, um, some other um, warfarin is on every list. <laughs> you guys hopefully have kind of figured it out by now. But um, so definitely another thing you have to be more concerned about is drug interactions. Um, and like I said, in comparison to other antimicrobials, this person is going to be on this maybe for nine months. So it is something really where you may have to adjust warfarin and really think about warfarin. Or if they're on a certain type of contraceptive, you may need to you know, have them on a different type of contraceptive, maybe two forms of contraception or... Um, or something, I don't know, or switch them to something else. Um, anticonvulsants is a seizure disorder. How bad is it? Do they need that medication? Then would you need to increase their anticonvulsant or their seizure medication? Um, so that's something that, again, has a big part and is important. So definitely, um, you know, put a star by that. And then related to drug interactions, uh, rifibutin, you'll notice that it wasn't mentioned as one of the, the top four first line from the CDC, um, but it is. it does have less drug interactions. So if that is a very big problem for the patient, for example, if they have HIV and they need to be on other medications chronically, this can be a rationale to then forego the rifampin and use the rifibutin. Um, so, so anyway, so just note that. But like I said, I'm not going to stress you guys over the special populations too much, um, but just know that's a potential strategy or that, you know, if someone is on rifampin um, and they're having problems with drug interactions, then they can be potentially switched. So, and I'd encourage you guys, if you have more time, I know you're super busy, um, or if you're on a specific rotation where it comes up where you're dealing with HIV patients, um, maybe spend some time on the CDC website to see about, you know, how to treat TB with HIV patients. Michael Jordan, okay, ethambutol. So again, just FYI, look at um, kinetics here, mechanism of action. So take home point, it basically um, inhibits an enzyme that results in impaired cell wall synthesis. So again, it's um, like some of the antibacterials we talked about, take home point um, blocks cell wall synthesis, mycobacterial cell wall synthesis. Uses, tuberculosis, what we're talking about it. Adverse effects, again, put a star by that. Want you guys to know that. Um, 
So basically it's eye issues, um, specifically can reduce the red-green acuity. Um, and then because of that, if the person's on it, they need to have an annual examination. Even if they don't have any problems, they don't wear glasses or whatever because of this drug. And then the hepatotoxicity, again, not boxed warning, so not as strict as the isoniazid, um, but something you still need to be concerned with and something to think about. Um, it's kind of like the rifampin, and again, partly that may be because just they're, you're on th these combination of drugs for a long amount of time that can, in combination, um, have hepatic toxic effects. Um, and also, like the rifampin, you don't need to worry about dosing adjustments for hepatic impairments. So that's kind of interesting too, but um, hepatotoxicity. So the, the big one here, or the one that kind of sticks out, is the, um, the eye effects, right? So optical effects. Pyrazinamide, the PZA, the pizza, if you will. No, okay, I'll stop making that jokes. Like I said, the, they seems to make fun of me for making dad jokes. That's another dad joke. <laughs> All right, uh, kinetics, don't worry about too much. I mean, we'll notice that it goes through the liver and that there's an issue with hepatotoxicity. Mechanism of action, so this is interesting, um, and this is one thing that I was kind of blown away with when I went to pharmacy school. Um, there's a pretty good number of drugs that we don't fully understand the mechanism of action or we don't fully know it and so if you look at a textbook it'll say the exact mechanism of action has not been fully elucidated which is um a smart way of saying uh we don't know so mechanism of action unknown um just so it's just suspected that this is what it does is this is what it involves so go ahead and read through it and, and know it um so for my test i don't like to to grill you guys on things that are unknown um, but for boards, you will sometimes see it or they will still talk about this. Is, so this is basically educated guess for mechanism of action. And this is what the majority of the evidence shows. Um, but again, textbook answer, mechanism of action, not elucidated or not fully elucidated. Sound, you sound fancy saying that, right? It's not fully elucidated. So <laughs> I guess you can, you could answer that too. Um, next time someone asks you a question and you have, you know, your response will be like, well, I don't, it's, um, it's, it hasn't been fully elucidated and it means, you know, I don't know. Um, but anyways, use for tuberculosis, which we want to, and adverse effects, again, put a star by this. We want to make sure you're paying attention to these and looking at these. So and there's just three here, the photosensitivity, um, which again is, is usually just mitigated with, um, using SPF or sunblock. Um, and so it's not something that, you know, requires you to discontinue the drug. It just takes some of the patients to have some lifestyle modifications. So definitely using more sunblock, um, long sleeves, big hat, maybe, um, Hepatotoxicity, again, you'll notice that that's, there's a theme here, so that's something you need to think about. It's not a box warning um, like the uh, isoniazid, um, and there's not dosing adjustments for hepatic impairment, but it is contraindicated in a person who has severe hepatic impairment. So that's something to think about. Um, and then again, it's like with the other ones, well, is it because you're using it in combination with these other hepatotoxic drugs? Um, it's something to think about. And then hyperuricemia, um, is something that you know may come into play if a person has gout or if they have other conditions where that could be an issue. And then interesting, there's a few different patient populations that you need to be careful when, when using this, but a lot of times they will still be put on these medications because it is life-saving and it is TB. So um, it's just something where your maybe your treatment for diabetes mellitus may be altered. So the the wording is that you just have to use caution so you'll notice caution isn't, that's not an absolute contraindication. It's just, it's just a concern you should have and just something you'll have to monitor their diabetes maybe more frequently um, because it can have um, some undesired effects. And the same thing if they have porf porphy porphyria, porphyria, ugh, sorry, I spit that out. And then history of alcoholism. Um, and this is related to the, to the liver too, to kind of connect the to dots. Um, another interesting thing too, with, um, as far as their, disease state. I mentioned the hyperuricema. Um, so if someone's having an acute gout attack, um, this medication is contraindicated because of the hyperuricemia it can cause. And, and we'll be talking about gout later and go into more detail as far as its treatments and everything. But anytime you see hyperuricema, think about gout. Um, and that's a connection you guys should be making. Rifibutin, um, like I said before, it's kind of a niche use. Um, it's like rifampin. Um, but you don't have to worry about the drug interactions as much. And so it may be used as an alternative treatment um, in TB. And again, refer to the CDC. But don't don't stress too much about it. Just take home point for my, my exam. Just know that it has less drug interactions than rifampin. And that can be a rationale as why it's used. 
Streptomycin. So we remember this from the aminoglycosides, hopefully. You guys listened to that lecture. Um, but this used to be first line, and so depending on your textbook, um, so like the, one of the textbooks I use is from 2010. It still has it as first line, but um, according to CDC, no longer. Um, and it is abbreviated SM. So when you see it, you know, like they have the abbreviations for all the other TB drugs. Um, you will see this abbreviated as SM. Um, but anyways, it's, it's, unfortunately there's more issues with resistance and it's just not considered first line. Um, the other thing to note too, is that, so TB is a worldwide issue. And so depending on, um, where you end up practicing or if you do a, a work international, et cetera, you may see some differences, but, uh, for my testing purposes and for the boards, it is based in the U S and then for, um, based on CDC recommendations. So, and the reason I note that is because, um, in the past we've had students that, um, have familiar or their educational background, maybe it's in public health or whatever, and they know about things that are done in, in other countries or whatever. But so anyway, so you may still see this being used in other countries or maybe recommended. Um, and it's still there. I mean, it's still, it's on the CDC website too, as being, um, something that's, you know, can be considered for TB, but, and then there's some other uses too, which is refer back to the aminoglycoside uh, lecture for the, for all those uses. But, couple mnemonics here. So you will see RIPE being used. So this is for rifampin, isoniazid, um, PZA, my favorite, and then ifampetol. Um, so R-I-P-E. Um, or you will see RIPES or RIPS. So this is maybe older textbooks that include the streptomycin. They'll put RIPES or RIPS. Um, but really, you can use whatever you want. I mean, any mnemonic that works. So here's some other ones. Peer, Repi, Perry, whatever you like. Or this is my favorite, R-I-P-E-Z-E. -E. I don't know, too soon, maybe. But any, any, um, so any, um, yeah, I thought this one was funny in school and I used to get a kick out of it. But this one helps me. So you have the R-I-P and then E. Alternative drugs, um, again, because of drug resistance, we have to be thinking about these. Don't stress too much about it. Just look through the list. Just know um, which ones are could be used as alternatives. But um, but don't worry then about going and, and learning a ton about these. And some of these, I mean, we've seen in other other lectures. Um, so like levofloxacin, and fluoroquinolone, right? You guys remember that? But um, so don't stress about finding a ton out on these. Dapsone, like I said earlier, it is kind of it's with. It's categorized with these, um, but it's not used for TB. It is only used for leprosy. Um, so just keep this one separate. Mechanism action inhibits folic acid synthesis. So remember like the sulfonamides. Um, and then adverse effects, there are some things you have to be worried about. Um, and just read through those. But the Dapsone, um, again, probably won't see this too much in your practice, day-to-day -day practice. I don't think I've ever dispensed it. Honestly, it was one of those that we just learned about in pharmacy school and kind of forgot about. But um, there's just no DAP zones for leprosy. So here's a good summary table here. And like I said before, I like the summary tables. You notice the rif rifibutin is lumped together with rifampin because they're very similar, other than the drug interaction concern, right? Um, so look through those, look at the clinical applications, and then look at the adverse effects and contraindications. Um, Definitely pay attention to those. And then please note too, streptomycin is no longer. So it's just the R-I-P-E, right? R-I-P-E-Z-E. -E. Those are the ones you have to memorize. I need to think about for first line drug. And please, please, please remember the adverse effects. Antiviral drugs. So this is a giant section. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of these drugs here that you aren't going to be spending a lot of time with on rotations and as a practitioner. Um, they still maybe be on your board exams, but um, I'm gonna go through and kind of highlight ones that I want you to focus more on. Um, and the big thing is here is just with HIV. HIV drugs are um, very extensive. Um, it's a specialty, it's like a subspecialty in pharmacy. It's a very specialized type of medicine. Um, and it just kind of depends on where you're gonna end up practicing as a PA. It'll be something that you'll deal with all the time or that you never deal with, or you deal with every once in a while, because they'll be like, let's say you're in a hospital, an ER setting, and every once in a while a person comes in when they're on some of these medications. So for, for me, for this first exam at least, I want you guys to just focus on um, just classification and just where they fall um, as far as what type of drug they are and what type of antiretroviral drug they are. Um, and then also with the interferons or the other ones too that um, I don't want you to stress too, too much about. So 
pay attention here as far as when I say like know these slides, don't know these slides, pay attention to this, don't pay attention to that. The other caveat too um, before starting here is just that um, we are going to have pharmacology 1, 2, and 3, and so with all of these antimicrobials, antivirals included, we will be coming back and visiting these depending on our module. So, And then with ICM, you may be seeing these um, in some modules and, and not in others. So um, mechanisms of action, um, basically they hit viral replication, so it's a way to kill the virus. And then this is just a visualization of it to help some people that are visual learners, but um, just don't stress too much about this slide and don't worry about memorizing it. It does show you where some of the um, medications work. So like amantadine, for example, is here. Protease inhibitors go here. Um, so this may help you with mechanism of action, but, um, but again, don't stress about knowing the order and then having to regurgitate this as far as uh, memorization is, is concerned. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we first have some drugs that can help prevent the flu or influenza. Again, I'm not sponsored by the CDC or don't have any interest. I wish, you know, I wish they did sponsor me and paid me to give these lectures, but they don't. Um, but the CDC is going to be a great, great website, great resource for, oops, sorry, for the flu, influenza. And this is seasonal. So this changes every year. Um, you guys may know from working in healthcare or from other courses or whatever um, that the flu is not static, um, that it does change. It is something you need to be keeping up to date with every year. So definitely this is something in the pharmacy that we will we'll print out new things from the CDC and make sure everyone is available and kind of knows current treatments. So again, um, just real quick, you feel free to fast forward through this if you, if you don't, if you're already familiar with this website and everything. Um, but, you know, I like this website a lot. It's great stuff. So influenza updates, for example, the 2016-2017 flu season is over. Good news, we made it through there. Flu activity is low in the U.S. And then the vaccine for the 2017-2018 flu season has been updated to match better circulating flu viruses. So um, it has vec recommendations, um, the guidance. So we're thinking about in our family, probably October, getting our um, vaccine. So, and, because, and that's because of the CDC's recommendations. So thank you, CDC. We appreciate you guys. Uh, we appreciate 24-7 saving lives, comma, protecting people. Thank you. You're helping me and my family out. Um, but so it recommends vaccination. And I'd encourage you guys all to, um, I believe there's flu free flu va vaccinations um, provided to you guys as students, or at least there were when I was like, this was way back when you guys were in diapers. When I was a student, they used to give us free flu shots. <laughs> um, but so you can get those for everyone six months or older before the end of October, if possible. So mark your calendars. What are we? We're in September, so you got a month or so to do that. Um, and then also too, it has the guidance for the flu season, 2017, 2018. So let's click on that. Hopefully, it doesn't take too long to load. Okay, um, and this is good. Again, once you're a practitioner, and also when you're on rotations, it has the changes and updates to recommendations. So this is you know you learn the initial. Um, recommendations and kind of a foundation knowledge which is great and then you go through here and then you can get your updates um, that way and I believe too that they have um, you guys will have to do continuing education for um, once you're a licensed PA um, and I believe they have some programs that are through the CDC or related to the CDC for PAs but don't quote me on that I'm not a PA but I think that there's those that can help you kind of stay up to date I like using those as a pharmacist it helps helps keep me up to date Another thing too to note that this CDC website is for everybody, so definitely I would recommend you guys to go to the health professionals section. So I know you guys just started pharmacy school. Oh man, sorry, amateur move there. I forgot to close my <laughs> my email before um, before recording. So pro tip: always close your email before doing integrity recording, because so they don't get emails during the recording. Sorry about that. So anyway, so yeah, so you guys are healthcare professionals, so definitely go through there because there's some stuff that's just for the lay public and it's, um, you know, again, you guys just started school, but you're, you're healthcare providers. So anyways, <coughs> um, you'll notice here they have the ACIP recommendations, which is a, um, they have guidelines on it. It's a uh, legitimate or kind of reputable board, um, a group of individuals that has that uh, vaccination, has information there. Oops, didn't mean to click on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, vaccination there. It has dosage administration, summaries, etc. And then antiviral drugs, which we'll, we're going to be talking about here. Um, it has, you know, which ones are used, what the recommendation is, etc. 
And you'll notice here, so influenza anti antiviral medication summary for clinicians. Um, I like here they have a, a table, which I always like tables. You guys probably already noticed from my slides. Let's see what that one looks like. Antiviral medications recommended for treatment in chemoprophylaxis of influenza. So this is a good one. Um, and I believe that this is just for 2016, 2017. So it's a little bit out of date. They, I don't think the CDC's come out yet with their most current ones. Because you'll notice here it talks about the three influenza antiviral medications are approved by the FDA um, during the 2016, 2017 influenza season. Um, so this is nice because it has the agent, what is uh, active against so influenza A and B, uh, the uses, so for treatment and prophylaxis, you can notice all three, recommended for, and then it has the age limitations here, not recommended for, and then adverse effects. So I think that's a, that's a great table um, as far as summary goes. I could be here all day and be going through a ton of stuff, but just so you know that the um, CDC, again, great resources for influenza. So here is a list of the uh, drugs that can be used for the treatment and prevention of influenza. Um, I went ahead and added the brand names here to these um, just because you will hear them referred to as their brand names. Um, but the Tamiflu does come in generic. So this is the Ulceltamivir, which is easier usually people say Tamivir. Uh, Zanimivir is Relenza is a brand name. This is the inhaled treatment. Um, so Tamiflu is PO, it's by mouth. Um, Relenza is, I, uh, P, I'm sorry, is inhaled is the inhaled one and then the permavir um, which is rapivab is an iv so it has you notice it has the iv in here um, to maybe help you remember brand names um, and all of these are can be used for influenza a and b it's going to depend on what the cdc recommends um, this for this upcoming season so as of now if you check the cdc website it does say that all these are good to use for last season but um, it's not something to know but these are all um, neuraminidase inhibitors and there's some more slides later on uh, the imantidine or imantidine. So, imantidine or imantidine, um, basically, they prevent the release of the, the viral nucleic acid into the host cell, which is good. So it helps reduce the spread of the virus. We're seeing that they um, can be used for influenza A um, prophylactically, and then Parkinson's disease too, which we'll talk about later um, in the neurology module, I believe is when we talk about Parkinson's. Um, and so it's one of those that you have to think of it both as antimicrobial, but then also as maybe neurological implications or something for, for PD or for Parkinson's disease. So, and I always have students ask me about that because it, they seem so far from each other, you know, something that can help prevent the flu, but then something for Parkinson's disease. So again, it's one of those where, um, the exact mechanism of action is unknown, um, but they just have been shown, there has been shown to have biz, um, benefits um, for for both things. So it can help, you know, prevent the spread of uh, the flu, um, but then it also can help with Parkinson's disease and drug induce the extra pyramidal reactions, um, which we'll talk about more in detail again later. But um, so unfortunately, I don't have a great answer. Um, and it's one of those that's just not fully understood, but it's something that they've observed enough in clinical studies, et cetera, to where you can prescribe these um, for these things. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah, interesting, but um, I won't have a great answer for you guys if you email me or whatever. Mechanism of action, basically um, not fully elucidated. Adverse effects, so this is gonna be for both amenidine and remit remitidine. Dizziness, anxiety, impaired coordination, and then Levito reticularis is a um, is a skin finding consisted of a modeled reticulated vascular pattern. Um, so this is where you'll have where the people describe it or textbooks and stuff um, is a lace-like purplish discoloration of the skin. So I've never seen it before, but you can you know Google image search it. I mean I've never seen it. <laughs> I'm go I can I can use Google image search. Come on people. No, um, I just haven't seen it ever in person. Is what I should have said. But um, it is one of those that uh, rare, but it's just rare rare adverse effects. And then as far as more common adverse effects, you can classify them as cardiovascular adverse effects of so things like orthostatic hypotension or peripheral edema, and then the CNS adverse effects, which we talked about, I mean, are listed here, dizziness, anxiety, um, insomnia, um, agitation, 
confusion, depression, etc. And then here are some um, interesting that the, so this is that ACIP I mentioned earlier. So this is Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It, they have their recommendations on the CDC website, which I, I highlighted earlier. Um, but it's interesting because they don't re recommend um, the use of this for influenza A infection for residents in the United States. And this is basically because of resistance. So the amantadine and remantadine are things that as a pharmacist I've seen. So some flu seasons, they will be recommended for the by the CDC, and then some they won't. Um, so it's just going to kind of depend. Um, and this is the most current recommendation I could find was from July 20, 2008, I'm sorry. Um, so it's just going to kind of depend. So you'll see it being practiced. And, you, and then again, depending if you're outside the United States, um, again, maybe being seen and prescribed. So now we have um, these neuro neuraminidase inhibitors. Um, so that's a good way to classify them as far as their mechanism of action, et cetera. We have the three here. I have on, on a previous slide, and uh, apologies, the permavir wasn't on the slide I gave you guys just because it wasn't um, out when I'm, last time I worked on these. But anyway, so that's, this is the newer one. It's IV, I listed it here. It's also listed on our previous slide, but so, um, these are the three there, um, and then they can both be used for influenza A and B. Um, and that, like I showed, that table from the CDC shows you know when and where and how, how and all that. But um, but don't stress about that for for testing purposes for me. But if you are interested in in knowing about um, when they should be used, so here we have the um, recommendations for treatment. Um, so you'll notice the three are listed here, um, and then when they're recommended. So that all can be used for treatment or prophylaxis um, as far as when they're used. So this one can be used in the youngest population, the uh, Tamiflu generic. Um, and then you notice here on the um, this inhaled zanimavir, um, you do need to be cautious with the people that have underlying respiratory dis diseases, so asthma, COPD, and that's listed on my slides there. And then adverse effects, I like these. Um, and again, they're on my, some of my slides too, but adverse effects, nausea, vomiting, um, zinimivir, you do have to be concerned with allergic reactions, um, and then also adverse effects, diarrhea, nausea, um, et cetera, um, the breathing adverse effects, and that's why it's not recommended for use in people who have asthma, COPD, and then the, the um, permavir, again, diarrhea, so you notice GI adverse effects are, are there. Um, you also notice too that um, with both the Tamiflu or the and the uh, Permavir, um, there have been post-marketing re reports of serious skin infections and sporadic transient neuropsychiatric events. Um, so that is something to one of the rare but serious to know on that. But basically, it's GI um, adverse effects, and then specifically with the Zenimidavir, think about breathing issues. Um, it is inhaled, so I think that helps you. Hopefully, will help you kind of mem remember that that's something to to um, to be cautious with. And um, so then we have these these adverse effects here to look at. But so add GI um, adverse effects here. Um, and then m please note that the uh, bronchospasms are something to be concerned with, with the zinimivir. Now changing gears here a little bit with the interferons. So with these, just know for a class, this is what they do. They inhibit viral penetration, inhibit viral encoding and inhibit peptide elongation. So basically take on point, they're all antiviral. Um, but with these, and you'll notice they're all here, listed here. These, I want you to just basically know how they're classified or where they're classified and that they are antiviral. So you notice this is a classification here, interferons. Um, and then, but as far as their uses, we will be getting to these later and see some of these more later on. So for this test, in these testing purposes for this first exam, um, don't stress about um, memorizing all of its uses. Same thing with adverse effects. Anti-herpes drugs. Um, I do want you to pay attention to these and make sure you know that, I mean, definitely classification that these aren't anti-herpes or, you know, that, um, and then uh, be able to, to know, you know, more about these drugs. So these are right here, this section here next so as far as availability goes um, 
don't worry too much about it other than just acyclovir or some of these anti-herpes medications because their viability is lower they do need to be given more so you will see acyclovir prescribed five times a day four times a day um, etc as far as the mechanism goes it's a little bit complicated just bear with me but basically acyclovir for example is converted to acyclovir monophosphate via virus specific thymidine kinase and then it's further converted to acyclovir triphosphate by other cellular enzymes. So it's this acyclovir triphosphate that inhibits DNA synthesis and viral replication by competing with um, another triphosphate that the virus has for viral DNA polymerase and being incorporated into the viral DNA. So the take home point is that the acyclovir inhibits DNA synthesis and viral replication. Um, but, you know, kind of kind of a little more complicated than that but but anyways that's that's the take on point definitely want you guys to make sure you know that inhibits DNA synthesis and viral replication used for herpes so it's an anti-herpes that kind of helps right so um, your cold sores which are medically known as herpes simplex which is I don't know if you get, or fever blisters people call them in layman's terms genital herpes uh, herpes zoster which is shingles which is um, after you have chicken box you can you have a chance of getting the shingles infection and chickenpox also, varicella, zoster. Um, and then in immunocompromised patients, they may be more susceptible to getting uh, herpes infections. And so if that's the case, they typically will give the acyclovir IV because of the poor um, bioavailability. So you have better absorption with when it's given IV. So as far as adverse effects go, most common ones are gonna be these top three here with malaise being the most common um, adverse effect. And then headache and GI distress are, are up there, but not as um, not as common. So malaise can be up to up to 10% um, of the patients where headaches like 2% and uh, GI distress can be like, you know, more 2 to 5%. Um, and by the way, don't worry about those percentages I just mentioned as far as memorizing those. Uh, students ask me, I just sometimes, so with adverse effects, sometimes, um, depending on the research, they will have percentages of the population that's affected. And I sometimes will give you those just because I like to kind of give you an idea of, of what, so like malaise, malaise is like 10 to 12% and then something like nausea is 2 to 5%. So you get an idea they're common, but then the malaise is something that you'd want to be maybe more concerned with. But as far as specific percentages, don't stress about memorizing them. Um, just know which ones are common and which ones are, are less common, rare but serious. Nephrotoxicity is an issue with IV administration, so that's something to think about. Um, and it's kind of related to that. It is These, these are medications that you do need to make renal adjust or, i'm sorry make dosing adjustments based on renal impairment um that is something you need to think about in this neurotoxicity just in general but then especially when you're giving it iv so then we have the gangsiclovir and valgangsiclovir um, both related um very related chemically speaking as far as a chemical structure the uh, valgangsiclovir is a prodrug um, so it's like a precursor to the gangliclovir and has much better oral availability. Um, and so it's something that you can give potentially oral. Um, these can both be used for cytomegalovirus, which is CMV, uh, retinitis. It's typically with um, with people who um, who have AIDS, for example, they will we'll get that. Um, it can also be used for CMV prophylaxis for people who are uh, solid organ transplant recipients. Um, so those are some other things, but basically take home points used for CMV, the cytomegalovirus. Um, the gang cyclovirs, they also make an ocular implant, um, that they, they can administer there for the specifically for CMV retinitis. Um, but the valve ganglocyclovir, they do not have the ocular implant. So it's only, only this one that they make in an ocular implant. And then mechanism of action, um, read through that, but take home point is that the, these, both these drugs inhibit viral DNA synthesis. So then, um, you know, cause death or cause problems with the virus then. Uses, I mentioned the uses there, uh, read through those. Adverse effects, these are pretty messy drugs, or rather they do cause a lot of problems. There's a lot of box warnings for these medications. So for example, the uh, hematologic toxicity, um, so anemia is something that, um, and pancytopedia, thrombocytopedia, um, and anemia have been reported. Um, they also can cause impairment of fertility. Um, 
switches can be bad. They also are very toxic to the fetus. So definitely absolute contraindication um, to not give during pregnancy, so avoid during pregnancy because of the fetal toxicity. Um, and then it's also, they've also been found to be cancer-causing, so they are carcinogenesis, or they're carcinogenic, rather, and they can, they, um, can result in uh, mutagenesis and carcinogenesis. Um, the other thing to note, too, with the pregnancy implications, um, so it is important that the, um, that the pregnant female does not um, have these, and it is recommended for them to have a pregnancy test prior to initiation, um, and then they have to use an effective contraceptive during and for at least 30 days after therapy, which is inter interesting to note. And then the other thing that's interesting is male patients should use a barrier contraceptive during and at least 90 days after therapy. Um, so it's definitely an absolute um, contraindication to avoid it during pregnancy. And also it's a, it's a box warning too, so that's pretty strict. So as far as the mechanization of Foscarnet um, is what we have next. Um, it uh, is similar to Ginkcyclovir um, in that it is uh, very static or it does um, stop the replication of the virus and that it is um, take on point it inhibits viral DNA synthesis. Um, so you can uh, note that. As far as treatment goes, um, it's not super popular as far as it depends on where you're going to end up practicing as far as um, if you're going to see it or not, but it's used for the uh, cytomicrovirus retinitis, um, herpes simplex virus, um, but typically for drug resistance. So if something fails or if it's resistant to, um, uh, it's resistant to, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. If it's resistant to acyclovir, for example, sorry about that. I don't know why I just blanked on that. Um, so herpes simplex infection, acyclovir resistant. Um, and that's actually related to one of its um, box warnings. So definitely look through here, read through the adverse effects. Um, but as far as adverse effects go, there are a few box warnings. There's three box warnings. Um, the first one is on um, renal impairment. So renal impairment is the major toxicity of phoscarnet. And it requires frequent monitoring of serum creatinine with dosage adjustments for changes in renal function and adequate hydration um, with the administration of phoscarnet is imperative. So you notice the potential here for um, electrolyte disturbances, etc. but definitely put a star by that. Renal impairment, and that is a major toxicity. The other one, too, that is a major toxicity and has a box warning is for the seizures. Um, so that's, it's, unfortunately there have been seizures associated with administration of this medication. So something to definitely be concerned about for every patient, but then more specifically if a person has a history of, of seizures. Um, and then kind of related that to that too, um, the recommendation also, um, is related to these electrolyte imbalances that if a person needs to be on this a uh, longer term that you may need to supplement with, um, electrolytes, just depending on if they have, you know, hyper, um, Kalemia, hypocalcemia, etc., that they may need to be on supplementation um, while they're on this medication because of the adverse effects. So that's also something important to think about. Um, the third box warning is appropriate use, quote unquote appropriate use. So it, the FDA notes that phoscarnet is indicated for the use only in immunocompromised patients with cytomegalovirus retinitis and mucocutaneous acyclovir resistant herpes simplex virus infections. So that's the SH. S, sorry, HSV. Um, so again, appropriate use. So just make sure um, that when it, this you are prescribing this or when you um, are thinking about using this, that there is an appropriate use. And so this is not typically a first line agent. So here's Sidofavir. Um, again, not commonly used. Um, use some for um, CMV retinitis. So you'll see that. Um, Maybe some, but again, not commonly used. And it has an off-label use too for, um, it has an off-label use too for the um, acyclovir resistant HSV or the herpes simplex virus infection, um, but you know, not commonly prescribed a lot. And even when it comes to the side of virus retinitis, um, maybe not first line because nephrotoxicity is a major dose limiting toxicity. Um, and also related to that, it does need to be given with probenicid, which is a, we'll talk about in the gout, um, it's a gout medication, so we'll talk about later in another module. Um, but 
the thought is that the prevenazid um, may prevent damage to the proximal renal tubular epithelial cells by preventing the uptake of sidofenir, sidofovir um, into those cells, and so helps reduce the nephrotoxicity is the idea um, with that. So it's something that you have to give uh, the prevenazid prior to the administration of the sidofovir, and then after um, you, you give these this medication. So um, big thing, to don't stress too much about this drug, just big thing to highlight. It's not used a lot. I may see it for CMV retinitis, but then the nephrotoxicity is a big is a big deal breaker with this one um, and is a big reason why it's not, um, not used. Other than that, too, there are some box warnings. So the nephrotoxicity is a box warning. The renal impairment is a major toxicity. Um, you have to be concerned with. Um, also, they have a box warning for neutropenia, um, and so that's another reason why it's not prescribed a lot. And then it can also, um, it's been found to be uh, carcinogenic and teratogenic. Um, so again, box warning for that. And then there's also a box warning for a quote-unquote appropriate use. So it's only indicated for the treatment of cytomegalovirus, retinitis, in patients with acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, so in AIDS, AIDS patients. So um, again, really niche use. I don't know if you guys will be coming across this or prescribing this. Um, definitely, I feel like my experience is more of a specialist thing, even for pharmacists, but um, so don't stress too much about it. Antiviral drugs. So those, we just went over the antiherpes. Now we're going to go to the antiretroviral drugs. And again, for this section here, I'm going to go through it pretty quick. I just want you to know where they're categorized. So for example, which ones are NRTIs, which ones are um, NRTIs, which ones are PIs, etc. So um, it's just more about knowing where they fit and what categories. So I'm going to go through these slides pretty quick. Um, yeah, so just read through these, but don't expect a ton of test questions from it. It's just going to be mainly um, for this module. Um, you may see it later on depending on, you know, what ICM wants to test you over, etc. But so this way, at least you have the drug names and you're familiar with, with where they go. Um, same thing too, just keep this for future reference, but not um, no testing question, no test questions from this first module for me. Um, same thing too, this is just more FYI for me, but um, may help you with ICM, it may help you with pathophys, but just basically take on point, AIDS patients have a decreased immune system, and so they have a chance of getting these opportunistic infections. Um, so, and similar to maybe some other immunocompromised people, but specifically for AIDS patients. Um, so take a look at those. But again, just FYI for, for my testing purposes. Are the antivirals. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. This will be the end of part one, uh, other antivirals, and we'll pick up here for part two. All right. So thank you guys for your attention. Feel free to email me uh, if you have any questions. All right. Have a good day. Bye.